So I realize that is a significant tool, like a moisture meter. But you don't want to be, XRF is not an expert. It's the guy behind XRF. XRF is a tool, and it will give you false information at times. There was a big issue that said if it's anaerobic bacteria, it cannot be in the drywall, it's exposed to the oxygen, can't be done. Patricia Williams, all the people in that network said, can't be done. We funded the money, said, do a test. This is 24 hours trying to drywall. That's domestic. We've done this test. This was last year in October, I sent to the Department of the Health. They would never send it back to us. We aerosolized this in the air that should produce and actually pull out fecal coli, human waste, bacteria, it jumped out of the dish, produced H2S in the same chemical concentrations that was in Chinese drywall. I am not a chemist, but I'm going to tell you right now, if this is not bacteria, then someone needs to explain this, because we've done this 25 times. It is an issue. Now, why the government will not look at this, that I can make it jump from one petri dish, two foot over, that's hepatitis. There's all kinds of elements that can come out of a dish and go two feet across the table. That's a problem. When all of a sudden the dish gets so high that it pops its lid up and knocks the chemist off his feet, we have an issue. Now, I don't know. This is the physical evidence. But I'm not a chemist. I don't know. But there's an issue with this. Now, you say, well, who did this study? How about the top toxicologists at the University of Florida? How about the nuclear facilities at the University of Florida and the top analytical departments at the University of Florida? And I wanted a contract with them, and they gave me use of the million dollar microscopes, and they opened up the entire departments. I said, you people got the technology. You're 10 minutes away from my lab. I want you guys to help us understand what we're dealing with. We also got in with Dr. Chinney and also with Dr. Sullivan, who was teaching with the Building Network Science Institute, the Raker School of College of Instruction. These guys are experts in construction. And they looked at me and said, we have no idea. So we've now been network with them trying to understand what these problems are. We wanted to go ahead and find out, first of all, as a forensic investigator, are these people lying? Is Chinese drywall the issue? Is it some other source? Is it well water? Is it uh, candles, sulfur candles from Ace Hardware? What is the issues? So we did a study. And I networked and met with Senator Nelson, um, Mr. Valentine, former environmental director for the Clinton administration. I got with Dr. Crow. Everybody I can find that were experts in their field, we hired, we paid them, and we said, call us. And a lot of them disagreed with one another. First thing we did is we wanted to find out it was a Chinese drywall. This is the one we actually produced and um, featured there to the Department of Health back last year. Purified the water. Blue, American, red, Chinese. When we were done, we basically, in three weeks, corroded and ate the copper. This is the American domestic drywall after three weeks. This is Chinese drywall after three weeks with one liter of air blowing over. <laughs> that is significant corrosion. We immediately went on record to put out press releases for people that were leaving in Chinese drywall, diffusing, painting, all this other stuff, and we said, it looks like it's going to be lipstick on the pig. If you leave that in with these corrosions, and I've been in four or five states and went all over the place, never charged anybody for a reason, because I didn't know what I was doing, and I was gathering information. I was trying to perform a forensic investigation and analysis to Chinese drywall, and with the effects and the performance problems were, and how to fix it. What's the protocol? After seven months, 18 hour days, seven days a week, with a crew of about 10 to 15 of us, you know what we found out? There's no pattern. Every home is different. We never, to this day, we still haven't found out. This is a man right here, Howard, said there was 2,000 drywall inspections. That's a lot, gentlemen. He finds stuff, hey, we just found a new one on one. So, there's a lot of things we don't know. And yes, it is complex when you can't find the pattern. And I've performed about 4,000 forensic investigations and been a part of them. And if you don't find the pattern, you got a problem. So if it's a level 1, level 2, level 3, or level 4 deviation, guess where you better be? You better be at level 4. Because if you're doing a level 2 and it's a level 4, you're going to get sued. So that's kind of the methodology that we use to go forward on this. And of course, work with Jack Frost on... Um, Many people here in the Institute, that many of you have heard, uh, asked it to be reduplicated at the University of Florida. Um, 
also at uh, ARS. And the big problem I have is I want to know if a low voltage line sets out for a warning system, or if it all of a sudden goes bad and someone breaks in the house and kills somebody, do I come liable because I left that copper in there? I didn't know what the Consumer Product Safety Commission was going to do over the last year, or Judge found that, thank God, smarter people prevailed and said, get the copper out. Again, once you break that protective coating, and again, you can do all the corrosion studies you want, but I challenge anybody here to spend the money I've had over the last year and a half and tell me that you can leave copper in a house. There, there, there are some serious problems with this, and if five years later a house burns down, anything else. I've been in homes with electric outlets that caught on fire. Okay? There's other homes, no problems. But here's the problem. Where do you start paying a guessing game? And where do you start assuming liability? And how much does it cost to go and just take it out, gut it, and do it right? So again, I believe in partial remediations under certain controls, but I also believe if you start put lipstick on the pig, you're going to get in trouble. And that's what we refer to the remediation industry as a patch job or a band-aid job. I simply, me personally, I'm not involved in those and probably never will be. And there's some other ones here. Now, we can save some money and fix it and do partial remediation. Fine. But be careful about your liability. Just some more testing that they did. This is the, uh, they said that the wood does not absorb hydrogen sulfide, carbon real sulfide, and all these other things. Well, I found out they were full of it. Because we pull more VOCs and cross-contamination, and people say, there's no such thing as cross-contamination. Okay, well, the studies we did that were very extensive, okay, showed there was significant levels. Robert Wessler, who is, works with me on the ASTM committee chairman that I chaired for C11 on Chinese drywall, made this statement. Gypsum is a sink. It will absorb these gases. I found an amazing thing having chemically sensitive people in my laboratory that would help me find the absorption rates of these chemicals and gases. They can build up and they can absorb. Now this is based on, I'm not a scientist, but this is what the scientists showed me. And one that was a 35 year corrosion expert at the University of Florida. And as we began to do these and pull out these VOCs, we found out we could diffuse them because as we heard other experts, these chemicals are very volatile. They will go quicker, but they will absorb. If you take an onion and take a cube of butter, you stick it in the same Ziploc bag and stick it in your refrigerator for a week, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Don't butter your toast in the morning with that butter. Now, I have found 1,000 ways how not to remediate Chinese drywall, and it costs me a lot of money. But I, I, once I grab the pipe by the tail, I'm a fully United States.